sifting out the reports and trying to make some sense out of them. And as, they, as we do tonight, we have some new figures in on the popular vote. Let's go again now to our Univac corner and get from Doug Edwards the latest predictions of that electronic marvel. Red Hot, off of our uh, big electronic Abacus, Walter, the very latest Univac presidential prediction. With, uh, For the election of 1956, this was state-of-the-art. Television wasn't afraid to spend the big buck. Most of us entered Cone from the local grammar schools, Sylvian Park, Park Avenue, and Cockrell. Remember how grown up we felt now that we are actually in junior high school? We got lost, worried about getting to class on time, and were very much afraid of the marshals. We were allowed to have junior high Red Cross and student congress representatives. Our main interest in sports was our home run basketball teams. President Eisenhower began his second term as leader, not only of America, but all free people. The year was 1957, months before Sputnik. American society itself was still black and white. It was the Ozzie and Harriet era, when Gunsmoke, Lucy, and Ed Sullivan dominated the evening lineup. Elvis becomes king of rock and roll in 1957, a sleek fellow with wild hips and the mellow singing voice. At age 13, Bobby Fischer becomes a chess champion. The Soviet Union inaugurates the space age by launching Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. B-52 bombers begin full-time flying alert in case of a USSR attack. Britain detonates the hydrogen bomb and the US conducts the first underground nuclear test. The president of the United States was Dwight D. Eisenhower, vice president, Richard Nixon. The heartthrob of thousands of American teenage boys, the 57 Chevy was one of the best looking cars of the entire post-war era. A new consumer-driven society was born. The average American production worker is now making $82.32 a week. Prices in 1950 varied. A house, $20,000. Average income, $4,494. A brand new Ford automobile, eighteen hundred and seventy nine to thirty four hundred and eight dollars milk was a dollar a gallon gas are you ready twenty four cents a gallon the poet arthur o'shaughnessy wrote each age is a dream that is dying or one that is coming to birth the year nineteen fifty seven was just such a time before we knew it we were eighth graders. Although we were still in junior high, we didn't feel so inferior now. We had become familiar with the routine of high school 
and had begun to feel that we really belonged. We organized our little league basketball and football. Even more important, though, was the fact that we could look down on those little seventh graders. As 1958 began, America sent aloft its first Earth satellite, the Explorer, drawing abreast of Soviet science with three more successful launchings during the year. Then in December, an Atlas ballistic missile guided itself into orbit to become by far the biggest artificial moon. Even more impressive, it carried a tape recording broadcasting to the world the President's message of peace. Man was pushing back frontiers on Earth as well. The atomic submarine Nautilus cruised under the Arctic ice and the North Pole itself. An historic underwater voyage from Hawaii to England. Her sister stopped trading the awesome power of the nuclear submarine and dramatically directing attention to the strategic Northlands. Fittingly, in that same year, 1958, Alaska finally won its long sought staple. Alaskans celebrated with an enthusiasm recalling sourdough days. A new state, twice as large as Texas, joined the Union. Right, new star was added to the 48th. Vice President and Mrs. Nixon toured South America and encountered rabid anti-Americanism, touched off by political ferment and economic troubles. Perhaps the prime candidate for man of the year was Charles de Gaulle. He returned to the premiership after France came to the brink of civil war when army forces and rightist settlers in strife-torn Algeria seized control and repudiated the Paris government. The death of Pope Pius, shown with Cardinal Spellman in some of the last films of the Pontiff, stilled one of the world's great voices for humanity. In an age of crisis, he had been among the champions of human rights and the cause of peace. The morning of half a billion Catholics for the deceased Pontiff was followed by keen anticipation as the College of Cardinals met to choose Pius' successor. It was Angelo Cardinal Roncalli who assumed the triple crown of Pope John XXIII, a weighty burden in time of continuing peril to the hopes of all mankind for freedom and peace. Next came the big year. We were freshmen. We were permitted to eat lunch with some of the seniors and go to the senior high chapel. Many of our friends were on the basketball team and cheerleading squads. With Miss Betty Allen as our counselor, we elected class officers for the first time. They were as follows, Cornell Buckley, president, Mickey Wilson, vice president, Linda Owens, secretary, and Terry Hayes, treasurer. We were allowed to join almost any club we wished we sang in the choir, and a few in our class became band members, and we chose our own subjects for the very first time. Before we knew, in the year had flown by, 
and it was time for ninth grade graduation, how proud we were of our certificates. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Three young singers who soared to the heights of show business on the current rock and roll craze were killed today in the crash of a light plane in an Iowa snow flurry. The singers were identified as Richie Valens, 17, Buddy Holly, 22, and J.P. Richardson, known professionally as the Big Bopper. The aircraft chartered from the Dwyer Flying Service crashed near Mason City, ironically the setting for the prominent musical The Music Man. The pilot, Roger Peterson of Clear Lake, Iowa, was also killed. The three singers had appeared at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa last night and were on their way to Fargo, North Dakota. Their small chartered plane crashed in a lonely farmyard about 15 miles northwest of Mason City. Cause of the crash was due to inclement weather conditions. Details upcoming from Action Central News. Chantilly Lace and the Big Bopper. Hello, baby. Yeah, this is the Big Bopper speaking. <laughs> oh, you sweet thing. Do I want? Will I want? Oh, baby, you know what I like. <laughs> 
As sophomores, we were really in senior high school. Our class officers this year were President Bobby Strickland, Vice President David Gothard, Secretary Judy Hessa, and Treasurer Linda Owens. We had our own judge, Billy Nash, in the student court. We gave a sophomore party and a dance and gaily decorated the dungeon with crepe paper and balloons. In June, we entertained the seniors with a reception after their graduation. At year's beginning and at year's end, Frenchmen clashed with Frenchmen over Algerian self-determination. The policy carried forward by De Gaulle with scurry, moral and physical courage. Independence came to over a dozen states peaceably, but in the Belgian Congo, freedom was followed by rioting and army mutiny. Rain. In Japan, fanatic students and leftist groups rioted for days on end, seeking to block the mutual defense treaty with America. In Parliament, an attempt to physically prevent ratification failed when the Speaker was carried to the platform and called to order the session that approved the treaty. Secret reconnaissance of Russia by high-flying American U-2 jets ended when one was downed deep in Soviet territory. Its pilot, Francis Powers, was made the subject of a showcase trial. Our extraordinary session of the United Nations, Khrushchev continued his boisterous boorish tactics. Britain's Prime Minister Macmillan was but one of his targets. Chief quarry was Doug Hammarskjöld, who won free men's admiration with his defiance of Russian attacks on his handling of the Congo crisis.
In New York for the General Assembly session was the greatest gathering of world leaders in modern times, all vying for the friendship and support of the new African states. One of the most fateful of many informal meetings in New York was that of Khrushchev and Castro, whose threat to Western Hemisphere solidarity was background for Ike's talks with Pan-American leaders. The birth notice of the year in America was that of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Jr., soon to be the first baby of the land. 1960 saw historic disasters. An earthquake reduced the Moroccan resort town of Agadir to a shambles overnight. Chile was racked by a series of quakes that took countless lives, left over a million homeless, and sent murderous tidal waves racing across the Pacific. Hurricane Donna skirts the Caribbean and the Atlantic coast. Two airliners collided and fell on New York City in the worst air disaster of all time. Shortly afterward, the supercarrier constellation burned. It took the greatest disaster force ever assembled in New York to conquer the blaze. In the greatest story of a momentous year, John F. Kennedy defeated GOP standard bearer Richard Nixon in one of the closest presidential elections on record. The youngest man ever elected president takes the burden from the oldest ever to hold the office as America enters the critical and challenging 60s. For our junior year, we chose the following officers. Billy Nash, President. Eddie Woodside, Vice President, David Gothard, Treasurer, and Belvia Pinkleton, Secretary. This year, we had a good football team with some junior boys playing on it. We went to the exchange boat in Jackson with our football team. Our boys won 20 to nothing. For the junior class attended at homecoming, we chose Jeanette Duncan. Members of our class were on the Tiger, Tiger Time staff, the Tiger staff, and in other organizations of the school. In the spring, some of the members of our class were chosen to be in the National Honor Society. As all junior classes do, we look forward to the junior-senior prom. We chose for our theme when knighthood was in flower. Our gym was transformed into a courtyard of medieval castle. For king, we chose Bobby Sexton. And for queen, we chose Diane Mayo. The day we received our rings, we began to feel as if we were really big people. As we left school on Saturday, June the 4th, we knew that when we came back, it would be as seniors.
John F. Kennedy settles into office as the 35th President of the United States, the youngest man and the first Roman Catholic ever elected to the office. I do not uh, regard the first man in space as a sign of the uh, weakening of the, uh, of the uh, free world, but I do regard the total mobilization of men and uh, things for the service of the communist bloc over the last years as a source of great danger to us. And I... In Jerusalem, the trial of Adolf Eichmann begins, reviving memories of the Nazi horrors of the Second World War. Entering the bulletproof prisoner's box is the man charged with the annihilation of millions of Jews in Nazi death camps. This Redstone missile is the center of world attention as Commander Alan B. Shepard, Jr. watches some final preparations before the United States attempts to put its first man into space. The 37-year-old Navy test pilot seems to be the calmest man of the hundreds involved in the launching as he walks to the elevator that will carry him 65 feet to the capsule. Hundreds of missiles have been launched from Cape Canaveral, but for the first time there is to be a man aboard just three weeks after the Russians say they orbited Yuri Gagarin around the Earth. While that flight took place in complete secrecy, there are hundreds of reporters here today to witness the flight of Commander Shepard. He gives the capsule a once-over with a test pilot's keen eye and gives a reassuring pat to standby astronaut Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn. It's his moment of destiny as he moves forward to the entry platform. It's 6.20 a.m., more than three hours to launching time, as his protective boots are removed and he prepares to take his place on the contoured couch in the capsule. Countdown is now approaching zero, and the tension is broken only by murmured prayers and quietly voiced hopes. Two years of work, tests, and more work are climaxed with zero. The rocket performs perfectly as it lifts the funnel-shaped capsule gracefully aloft. Named the Freedom 7, the Mercury vehicle could be released by either the pilot or ground control should something go wrong. But quickly the reports come back. Everything A-OK, -okay, A-OK. -okay. And here it is. The greatest advance in television since color television itself the ultimate in performance and convenience. Seven function remote control color television, so beautiful it enhances any decor. Clean, modern styling. No knobs or gadgets in sight. Superb cabinetry, master crafted of the finest woods. But the outstanding feature of this great new color set the one big feature that sets it apart is an amazing new wireless wizard electronic remote control. So perfected, you can operate every control, all seven functions, and each function is completely variable. Tint, color, brightness, volume, fine tuning, channel selection, on off, you can tune either with the remote unit from your easy chair or use the push button panel in the cabinet. As we entered school in September, we were saddened because this was our last year at Cone. We furnished the following student government officers, President Billy Nash, Vice President Billy Pomeroy, Chief Marshal Raymond Crowell, Speaker of the House Linda Owens, Court Clerk Nancy Smith, Secretary Faye Myatt, Treasurer Bobby Strickland, and Chaplain Marjorie Bolton. David Gothard served as Chief Justice, and Thomas Russell and Edward Faulkner were the Senior Justices. For
class officers, we chose Jerry Hartman, President, Eugene Greer, Vice President, Secretary Sandra Sorrell, and Treasurer Thomas Russell. This year, we could choose the homecoming queen and our choice with Mar Martha Kleinard, whose attendants were Joan Ferguson and Linda Armstrong. When Christmas came, we all enjoyed parties, programs, and delivering baskets to the needy. But the season joy was saddened because this was our last Christmas at Cone. After midterms, we were on the last lap of our high school journey. We were measured for caps and gowns and ordered our invitations. Those of us who were going to college applied, and others were looking for jobs. After, these, after this goes to press for the rest of the year, we will enjoy Easter holidays, the prom, the senior trip, and senior day. Last of all, we'll come that night in June when we walk down the aisle for our diplomas. They will be our reward for all our hard work. After that, we can no longer be students of Cone. We, the class of 61, are proud of our history. We shall be proud to be called alumni of Cone. As we leave, we want to request all future students of Cone to always uphold the ideals for which Cone stands. To Mr. Rochelle, Mr. Hagen, and all our faithful teachers, we say thank you. You have been our guides down the road of learning. To Miss Allen, we wish to say many thanks for her guidance through four years of high school. We shall always look back in these years at Cone as the happiest of our lives, while we hope our schooling has prepared us to take our place in the world of men and women.